So it's my favourite time of the month everyone because it is Night Sky News time where we recap everything that's happened in the news in the past month and we look forward to what we can see in the sky in the upcoming months. So let's start with that by looking up. So first up on the 29th of March, the moon is going to come really close to Saturn in the morning, pre-dawn in the southeast sky. So the moon's actually only going to be about two fingers width away from Saturn, just below Saturn in the sky. And so if you actually have binoculars and you can get your binoculars on the moon and Saturn, you should be able to see them both in the same field. So it should be a really spectacular sight to start off a morning with. Then on the evening of the 30th of March, which is this Saturday, Mars is going to be really close to the Pleiades star cluster in the sky. So the Pleiades, I like to think of it as kind of like a miniature plough or miniature Big Dipper, as sometimes people call that constellation. It's a little star cluster in the sky that's really, really nice to see through binoculars. And also Mars will be in the same binocular field at the same time as well, sort of early evening on Saturday. Mars is actually hanging around that area of sky for a couple of days around Saturday, but Saturday is when it has its closest approach to Pleiades, so it's the best time to sort of try and get a glimpse of it. If you find Orion, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, follow the belt stars up past Taurus and the bright red star Aldebaran until you hit the Pleiades, and that's where you need to look for it. And if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, follow the belt stars down towards Pleiades instead, and you should also be able to catch a glimpse sort of in the southwest. So I just mentioned Aldebaran. Also on the 9th of April, Mars, Aldebaran and the Moon will also be very close together in the sky in the early evening in the southwest. And Mars and Aldebaran will look very red. Aldebaran is a red giant star, uh, end of its life, sort of running out of fuel and it's swollen up before it's probably going to have some sort of nova or supernova. Then on the 15th of April, this is for people in the south, and I am gutted that I won't be able to see this, but there's basically going to be a planetary alignment in the sky one morning where you're going to see Jupiter, Saturn, Pluto, Neptune, Mercury and Venus all in a line in the sky in the early morning before dawn. And this is not unusual to see planets all line up like that because all the planets orbit in a plane in the Milky Way, all in the same sort of general plane in the sky. So they tend to follow the same paths along the sky as well. It's something we call the ecliptic. It's the path the sun takes through the sky as well. So it's not that weird that they're all gonna line up. In the UK here, we're gonna struggle to see that. We're gonna be lucky if we basically see Jupiter and Saturn and maybe Pluto. Obviously Pluto and Neptune, you're gonna need a telescope to see those, but it is a good opportunity to break out the telescope if you do have one and see if you can spot the fainter planets while they're all sort of nicely in a line for you to find them. So that was everything to look out for in the sky this coming month. So let's talk about everything that's happened in space news in the past month, because again, there's a lot of it. So a lot of the results and papers that came out this month were off the back of the Lunar Planetary Science Conference that happened in Texas in the third week of March. And it brings together astronomers, geologists, geophysicists, etc., to basically present results on solar system missions and results from those that are ongoing. So one of the big announcements from that was that NASA is planning a mission to Neptune's moon Triton, which they're going to call Trident, which is really exciting because we haven't flown past Neptune since the 80s when Voyager 1 did it. So it's been a really long time since we've been back there. The mission is planning to also do a, a gravitational sling slingshot of Venus and then also go past Jupiter's moon Io, which is also very volcanic, which would be really cool to see. And the reason that they want to go to Triton is because it's what we've dubbed an ocean world. It's got this really thick crust of nitrogen and H2O ice on its crust around it, but we also know that it has a lot of volcanic activity as well going on. So we think it might be that they're heating the inside from the core in Triton. And so you end up with this like liquid ocean that underneath that crust of ice that may be harboring some form of life, like we see near like deep sea vents uh, on Earth, you know, sort of right at the bottom of the ocean floor. So it'd be really exciting to send a mission there. So I'm re I was really happy to hear that announcement from NASA. Then there was updates from the Hayabusa 2 mission, the JAXA mission that's gone to the near-Earth asteroid Ryugu, and similarly from NASA's mission OSIRIS-REx that is currently at the uh, near-Earth asteroid Bennu. And there was very different conflicting results from that. So both have been analysing the surface and both have found that it's been a lot more sort of rubbly than they originally thought. They thought it was quite, both had quite smooth surfaces, but in fact it's been 
covered in boulders, which has hampered both missions actually landing on the surface because they can't find a smooth enough place for them to land. But also they've been analyzing the different elements that they can detect from the surface of the asteroids as well. And in Ryugu's case, they've barely found any water or water ice or compounds that suggest that water once was there interacting with the rocks and soil. Whereas on Bennu, they found quite a lot, which is telling two different stories because there's a lot of theories that suggest that maybe Earth got a lot of its water from comets and asteroids from the early solar system impacting with the Earth and bringing water ice to the Earth that melted to form our oceans. Now, Ryugu being completely dry of water or any ice suggests, okay, well, maybe that didn't happen. But then Bennu being very water and ice rich is like, well, maybe it did happen then. They're telling two very different stories. So we really have to understand what's happening here to these two different asteroids, why one might not have much water, why one might have quite a lot. So there's theories suggesting that Ryugu's maybe did have water or ice in the past, but it's been evaporated due to heat from the sun or perhaps from interior heating that's going on as well. And then we have to figure out how Bennu has managed to hold on to its ice instead. But also the OSIRIS-REx team were catching people up on the discoveries of these particle plumes coming out from Bennu as well. But again, we can't really explain why that's happening. So most of them shoot off into space, but some of them go into orbit around Bennu and then fall back to the surface. So that could explain the sort of rubbly nature of Bennu's surface a bit as well. But there's no current theory for the mechanism that's actually powering these particle plumes that are coming out of the side of Bennu either. So really interesting findings happening here. And I'm really excited to see what these missions will find in the future, and then also what we'll find when they bring a sample of that asteroid back to Earth in a couple of years too. One of my favorite results though from the past month was that NASA's Fermi telescope, which is a gamma ray telescope in space, has detected a pulsar moving at 2.5 million miles an hour away from this big shell of a supernova remnant that we've spotted in radio waves as well, which is just like, what? <laughs> like, as if pulsars weren't cool enough. So pulsars are basically spinning neutron stars. So a neutron star is what you get when a massive star goes supernova and leaves this extremely dense core of neutrons behind. It's basically neutrons as densely packed as they can go. It's the densest way that we know that we can get matter. And so these neutron stars are also spinning. And when they spin, they give off these gamma rays out of their poles that basically we detect as like lighthouse beams. So as it spins, it sort of beams across our viewpoint in Earth. And we detect that as a very regular pulse of gamma rays. This one that they've detected pulses every 8.7 seconds. So you can imagine how fast this massive star thing must be spinning in space for us to detect something every 8.7 seconds. And this pulsar that they found has been dubbed J0002 plus 6216, which sounds like a phone number to me. So I'm just gonna call it J2 for short. So this J2 is in the direction of Cassiopeia in the sky, the constellation it's about 6,500 light years away. And they found it 53 light years away from the supernova remnant that we call CTB1 that we think went off about 10,000 years ago or so. And so what they've essentially found is that J2 has got this like airplane contrail streaking out behind it that shows that where it's come from in the center of this supernova remnant. And this contrail comes from the fact that J2 is moving through the interstellar medium of like dust and gas between stars. And it basically creates a shock wave as it goes, which triggers a lot of magnetic activity that gives out radio emission. And so we've detected this radio emission with the VLA, the Very Large Array, which is a radio telescope in New Mexico in the States. And by using the fact that we do have this very regular beam of light coming from it every 8.7 seconds, they've been able to use those timings of those pulses to work out how fast it's actually moving away from that supernova remnant. As I said, it's incredibly fast. It's like five times faster than we've seen any other pulsar remnant moving away from a supernova. So obviously they usually get this like kick in speed from the explosion in the supernova that fires them out from the center of that remnant. But it's five times faster than the fastest one we've ever seen. So that isn't even like the average speed of pulsars that we see either. It's like the fastest on the edge of the tail of the distribution. It's going so fast in fact that it's faster than the escape velocity of the Milky Way galaxy. So so eventually one day it will even leave our galaxy 
as well, which is ridiculous. And we don't really have a theory at the minute to explain why it got such a large speed kick from this supernova. So there's gonna have to be further study of this thing as well to try and work out how this has happened. So I was gonna do like a Space is Weird series on J2, but I figured let's wait until there's been more results and we know more about this thing and then we can speculate more about how it might have come to be. And then the big news this month that you will probably already have seen in the news is the successful testing of SpaceX's Dragon capsule to get astronauts up to the International Space Station. So if you remember at the back end of 2018, the Soyuz module had a serious issue on launch, which meant that it was grounded while they did all the tests to check that it was still capable of flying. And that was a real issue because after NASA retired the uh, space shuttle, what, like 10 years ago now, it was the only way we had of actually getting astronauts to the International Space Station. Um, and so if that thing was grounded, there was a real chance that if it hadn't been cleared for flight again before the next set of astronauts were due to go up, we could end up with an empty International Space Station with no astronauts in it for the first time in, say, 20 years since it was first built, which would have been a real shame, especially because, you know, there was many countries that paid for that ISS to get built, and it's this constant ongoing experiment. So the fact that SpaceX have been able to successfully show this month that on launch and then attachment to the International Space Station and then return by splashdown uh, into the sea that this Dragon capsule that they've built is indeed a viable method to get astronauts up to the space station is a really big deal. So it means we have a new way of getting astronauts there. The Soyuz, you know, is sort of 60s, 70s tech. So it's, it's reliable tech, really. It's never really had that much, big of an issue, but it's old technology. And so that will obviously have some issues in the years going forward. So we definitely need a replacement for that. So I was very, very encouraged by the fact that SpaceX showed that their module uh, was definitely a viable way. And I, there should be uh, tests with a manned crew later this year. So the one that they did this month was actually unmanned. They obviously did it to prove that it worked first. So the date for that manned mission hasn't been set yet, but the astronauts for that mission have been chosen. And that's four gentlemen uh, from the US trained by NASA. Uh, it does mean though probably that all female spacewalk is probably gonna have to wait a little bit longer if they're sending up more men to the space station. That was supposed to happen uh, at the end of March, just in a couple of days actually on Friday the 1st all female spacewalk uh, outside the ISS. That was supposed to be uh, Christina Koch and Anne McLean were set to walk on Friday the 29th of March. They're both engineers on the space station. And that would have been really exciting because there's been 213 previous spacewalks that were either all male or male, female. But the reason that this was supposedly canceled is because they only have certain sizes of the spacesuits on board the ISS. And there wasn't enough spacesuits of the same size for both uh, female astronauts to walk at the same time and both feel comfortable. So one of the astronauts said that she actually felt more comfortable in medium size uh, spacesuit they had, um, which was also the spacesuit that the other female astronaut needed. And there wasn't two of those ready in working order in time for the mission on Friday, the 29th of March. So that spacewalk will still go ahead, but it will be led by Christina Koch and her colleague Nick Haig instead. So it is encouraging to see that this could even have been scheduled in the first place. Anne and Christina were actually from NASA's 2013 class of astronauts, which were 50-50 male and female, perfect gender equality in there. So it is very encouraging to see that. And I'm sure it's very encouraging to all women who work in NASA and in the field of uh, space research or astronomy research as well. I know I am very encouraged by it and I hope it will be inspiration sort of for the next generation of scientists, young girls and boys around the world who will be encouraged uh, into science. So that was this month's Night Sky News. Thanks for sticking around until the end. You know you'll be rewarded with bloopers if you do, so I know that's why you have. Um, I will see you next time, but until then, without further ado, here's everybody's favorite part of the video. So a lot of new results that came out this past month Past month? Past month. What have I got in my eye? Uh, like I'm in a My Chemical Romance video. Uh, I hope it's clear that I'm saying Alderaan and not Alderaan. <laughs> Sorry, Star Wars fans, if I've confused you. I feel like Lara Croft talking about planetary alignments. Like I should be like strapping on the gun belt and going hunting off the Illuminati Triangle. Like I really should have worn a Joy Division t-shirt when I knew I was talking about pulsars today. That was very bad planning on my part. Let's dance with Joy Division and detect some pulsars with Femi. And so the other thing the OSIRIS-REx team was talking about at this conference this month was the particle plumes that they've discovered. Did I just say particle plumes?